Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Heidi Cook and thank you for joining us today. When I'm seeing patients at the Spa at West Glen for cosmetic consults, they often end up bringing up some of their unhappiness or dissatisfaction with the area underneath their chin, basically their double chin. And they're wanting to know if, if there's anything they can do about it and what that could possibly be. Last year, in 2015, the FDA approved a new injectable treatment for um, treating basically your double chin or the submental fullness. So we're gonna tell you about that today and see if that's something that is that will work into your life. Also, last week on the show, I started talking about the anti-aging medicine and we went through and discussed some processes that speed up aging and can contribute to the chronic diseases that we see with aging. So today I'm gonna to introduce to you a book. It is about lifestyle medicine, and I want to give you a couple examples from that book, and hopefully by the end, I will have convinced you that you do have a lot of control over your health, and the choices that you make are very important. So before we get to that, I want to give a shout out to Sam and Gabe's on Hickman Road in Urbandale. They are open for dinner, have live music on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. In addition, they have a great brunch on Sundays from 10.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. and they are opening a second location down in the East Village this fall. So check them out on salmongabes.com. You can see them on Hickman Road and soon in the East Village. Welcome back. So let's jump right into looking at Kybella. Kybella is the injectable medication that was FDA approved last year for the treatment of submental fullness or fat, or basically your double chin. So let's take a look at this product and we can, I'll tell you how it works, what it does, and what you can expect if it's something that you choose to do. So first of all, let's look at the causes of double chins. So basically, there's three big ones. The first one is genetics. And you can see this often if there are a lot of people who take good care of themselves, they exercise, they have low body fat, but they still have the fullness under their chin. And a lot of times they'll tell us, you know, it is my mom or dad had that same thing. So genetics does play a big part into double chins or submental fat. Um, the, another one is weight gain. So first of all, I wanna definitely put it out there that Kybella is not a weight loss method. You can have um, your double chin that progresses because of weight gain and you can treat it with Kybella, but definitely not considered a weight loss method. And the last one is aging. Just from aging, we tend to get more fullness under our chins. So that is where um, double chins typically come from. So what is Kybella? So Kybella is a deoxycholic acid. And what that is, that acid is found naturally in your body. It is actually part of your GI system and its job in your body is to emulsify and break down fat. So it's perfect for the function that they were looking for. So deoxycholic acid is made in a lab, but it is molecularly the same as what is found in your body. It is not made from any human product or from any animal product, which the thing about that is that decreases the allergic reactions um, substantially. So it is made in a lab, but it's similar to what, or it's exactly the same as what is in your body. So what, how this works is you have, um, if you go in and have a consult, they will obviously look at the area, see how much fat is there, and then the injections, when they inject the product, it is a cytolytic agent. So what that means is it will go in and it will break apart the cell membrane and the, disperse the fat. Now the good thing is, is when you get rid of a fat cell, it's gone forever. So that is kind of how Kybella works um, in the body. If you go in for a treatment, um, at your doctor, the first thing, like if you came into the spa at West Glen, the first thing we would sit down and we would talk about the product. And I would take a look, we would notice 
um, take note of the distribution, how much fat is there, the area of the fat. We'd also take a look, make sure there's no um, infection near the area. We would want to know if there was any surgical scars or scars from accidents and just know every ana anatomically what is going on. The next thing that we would do is we would make some markings. This would allow us to know exactly where our treatment area is and in addition to that it gives us kind of the no-go zone. There's one area that you definitely want to avoid and the reason for that is there is a nerve that comes right down your jaw and it drops about a centimeter below your jaw and you don't want to get that nerve. That's a marginal mandibular nerve um, and so you don't want that nerve to be hit because it will cause a paralysis. Uh, you can get drooping of the side of your mouth. The good thing is, is in the studies, it, this did happen to someone, but it was 100% um, reversible, so, or temporary. So that is the good thing. So we make markings, we delineate where we want to treat, where we don't want to go, and then we put a, a grid onto the area. So this grid is a matrix of dots that tells the injector basically where they need to inject. The dispersion of the medication, so you put the medication in and it will disperse about one centimeter. So you have your injection sites about one centimeter apart. So when you go in, they'll mark you, identify the area and put the dot matrix on. Typically then what I do is I hand the patient um, ice packs and have them ice that area. While they're icing, and I like them to ice for at least five minutes, if not longer, um, I'm getting everything else ready for the, and getting everything drawn up for the injections. When we inject, the injections are actually very simple. They don't take very long at all. But what you experience from the patient side of things is about 15 to 20 seconds after the injections start, they describe it as a kind of a burning sensation and a warmth. And what is happening during that time is those fat cells are actually breaking apart. So that is where the ice comes in. Um, some patients who have had this treatment did it without ice and rated the discomfort at about an 8 out of 10. With ice, it was more about a 3 out of 10. So we do aggressively ice before. Sometimes I'll ask them kind of midway if they want to ice again. And then I have them ice for a good 10 to 20 minutes afterwards. The burning sensation that the patients have described lasts for about 20 minutes and then subside. So what I like, I like patients to know exactly what they can expect before they do this treatment. One thing is, is there will be, and it is expected, that there is swelling. It's not a matter if there will be swelling, it's just how much swelling. The swelling can be significant, especially for the first two to three days. So. I ask people you know, what their social calendar looks like for those first couple of days because they probably don't want a whole lot going on. The swelling then starts to go down and most people have resolution of the swelling in the first week if not two weeks. After that they are left with um, some induration. What that is is just some firmness of the area. Well, what is going on here is an inflammatory reaction. And in many cases in the body, we don't like inflammatory reactions, but here it is doing us some good. And what that is, is the body pulls in extra um, molecules to kind of clean up the area from these fat cells breaking apart. What that does is causes this inflammatory reaction and causes the skin to retract a little bit. Now, I don't want to give you the impression this is neck lift type proportions, but it does help retract. So that inflammatory reaction is really not something that we want to get in the way of. Because of that, I do tell patients to expect swelling and expect some kind of firmness for a while. Um, my instructions to them when they go home is to ice as much as they want um, and to, if they need to take something for discomfort, to take Tylenol. If they take ibuprofen, if they take Aleve, those are, again, those are anti-inflammatory medications, so we want to stay away from decreasing that inflammatory response. So they go home, they ice, they can take Tylenol, then I instruct them to do some things to not increase the swelling. Those would be preferably not to exercise for 24 to 48 hours, to avoid salty foods, 
to drink water and maybe even that for a night or two to sleep on an extra pillow or two just so they're a little bit more upright. Um, other than that, there's not much else they need to do. These treatments are treatments that need to be done in a series. The studies were done with up to six treatments. I think in the real world it's going to be more two to four treatments and the treatments should be at least four weeks apart. You want a lot of that initial reaction gone before you do the next treatment. So in my practice I'm seeing it's more six to eight weeks before we retreat. Any reaction with swelling seems to be less with subsequent treatments. So if their under chin area is of um, a problem for you, if it causes you unhappiness or distress, there is some things that you can do. It's a great product for people who do not want to have surgery or for people who have just kind of mild um, double chin but want to do something about it. If it's of interest, please call the spa. We can help you find the information you need on Kybella. So on last week's episode, we started talking about anti-aging medicine. And in that episode, we talked about some processes which increase or speed up the aging process, but also things that increase and speed up the chronic diseases that come with aging. So today I wanted to introduce you to a book. This book is called The Original Prescription and is a book about basically lifestyle medicine. The author is Dr. Gilliam, and I had have the pleasure of um, being in several seminars and listening to him lecture. He um, in received his PhD in molecular immunology from the Medical College of Wisconsin, and since 1996 has been um, researching and studying the mechanisms and actions of natural-based or natural-based therapies, and is an expert in the field of nutritional supplements. He actually works for Orthomolecular, which is one of the medical or pharmaceutical grade supplement companies. In this book, he says that a, some of the information or a lot of the information isn't new per se, but what is new is all of the um, studies that have been done that now prove scientifically that these things actually work. So what I want to do is I want to go through and tell you just a couple of examples that he actually talks about in the very beginning of the book. And hopefully what this I can convince you is that we need to look at things a little different. We need to ask good questions. And then we also hopefully I can convince you that we have a lot of control over our own health. So the first example was if you think back to um, April of 2009, they reported that there were two kids in Southern California that had come down with a respiratory illness. Um, soon after that, they were the first two confirmed cases of H1N1 flu or swine flu. Shortly, they had diagnosed um, several more, I think about 14 more cases in that area. And as soon as that happened, the media took off with it. Every time you turned on the news, they were reporting the new number of confirmed cases, the names of the victims, how they anticipated the disease to spread, and then started talking about a hopeful vaccine. So jump ahead to October of 2009, and that is when that vaccine came out. However, it was in relatively short supply. I don't know if you remember seeing on the news the lines of people waiting to get this vaccine. A few did, not a lot of them actually did not. If you look at the numbers, if you look at before 2009, the deaths related to influenza in those years right before that were around 36,000. So 36,000 people died per year of influenza related illnesses. In the year around this H1N1 scare, um, it was so from April of 2009 to May of 2010, there were just over 12,000 deaths. So they were about a third of the deaths. So the point here is um, everybody, everybody thought it was gonna be a big epidemic and there was a lot of media coverage, a lot of hype. Um, some people got the vaccine, a lot didn't. So I don't think you can contribute the vaccine to a lot of that drop and definitely we expected a lot more. My point here is, and his point was, in that same time frame, so in that year, 
1.38 million people died of chronic diseases. 3,800 people died each day of um, cardiac problems, of diabetes, of other chronic illnesses. So while influenza and these 13,000, 12,000 to 13,000 deaths got a lot, of, a lot of media coverage, the chronic diseases didn't get any. My second example is, if you read information, our life expectancy is increasing. And that is a good thing, but if you also look, the percentage of people who are being diagnosed with chronic diseases is also increased. Well, some people would say that's expected. If you're living longer, you can expect there will be more chronic diseases. However, the problem is those people that increase in chronic diseases, those people are getting diagnosed at a younger age. So what is contributing to the increased life expectancy? One thing is um, we have reduced, greatly reduced infant mortality, which is wonderful. The second thing is the medical knowledge and the medical technology that we have is advancing and we are able to save people and to treat people who have more illnesses, whether that is in the emergency rooms, in the surgery center, in the cancer wards they have more technology so we can save these people. So prolonged life, absolutely. The life expectancy is more. Healthier life, kind of questionable. So what this means is there is, in both of these cases, we talked about chronic disease. So what is chronic disease? Well, first let's look at the comparison between acute and chronic. So acute illnesses are things where there's a definite, it seems that there's a definite cause and effect. So for example, if you have strep throat, there is a strep bacteria somewhere in the mix. If you have chickenpox, there is the chickenpox virus, the varicella virus in there. So definite cause and effect, and in acute illnesses, it's coming from something outside of us. In chronic diseases, the cause and effect really isn't all that obvious. And in some cases, even, you know, say lung cancer, some people would say lung cancer and smoking, but that's not always the case. There are some, con some episodes of lung cancer that are in non-smokers. So what is it about chronic diseases? It's not coming from the outside, so it's coming from the inside. And what they have noted is that it is really a problem with our lifestyle and our environment. So that's a lot of what this book is about, is looking at kind of lifestyle and environment. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is a very interesting study, and this study is um, ongoing. It has several different arms, so a lot of it is going on, but I just want to look at the basic study, um, and it is called the Epic Norfolk Study. So this is a study where they looked at 20,000 men and women. When they entered the study, they were anywhere from 45 to 79 years old. And at the beginning of the study, they were examined, laboratory tests, and were noted to not have any chronic illnesses. They entered the study between 1993 and 1997, and they watched all of these people until 2006. So 11 plus years they were watching these folks. So what they were looking at was they wanted to be able to say, okay, this, these health behaviors cause mortality. They wanted to kind of quantify it. So the four health behaviors that they decided to look at were um, smokers or tobacco use, um, alcohol use, and they actually, with the alcohol use, what they were looking at was they thought it was okay if that someone had one to 14 units of alcohol per week. So what a unit is, is half a pint of beer, um, a glass of wine, or a shot of spirits is what they were talking about. So really one to two a day on average was in there okay. So we have tobacco use, um, alcohol use, uh, physical inactivity, basically exercise or no exercise, and then they also looked at plasma vitamin C levels as an indication of what their nutrition was like. So what they found is they gave points to these people, and what they found is if you did all those things, let's take a 56-year-old man who does all those things wrong. He smokes, he doesn't exercise, he drinks a lot, and he doesn't eat well, and his plasma level of vitamin C was low. He has the same risk factors at 56 years old, of, or the same mortality risk as someone who is 70. So basically doing all those things right 
can potentially take 14 years off your life and the reverse. Doing a 70 year old who does all those things right, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink much, um, exercises and has a good nutritional um, diet has the mortality rate or risk of a 56 year old. So hopefully through these examples I have shown how chronic disease is an issue for us today and also hopefully you realize that you do have more control over your health and that we have the potential to make ourselves live healthier, live longer, and more energetic lives.